Hello friends, for today's video we are looking at episodes 11 through 15 of the original Avatar The Last Airbender's third season. A reminder if you missed last week's video that the Day of the Black Sun would seem is originally a two-parter, but based off of how I've been doing my batch reviews and reactions, I do them in five episode chunks, which did mean I had to stop in the middle of this section, which was a little bit brutal, but getting into it, we were looking at the second half of the invasion. And I think that the speech that Zuko ends up having when he confronts his father, I really, really liked it. I really like that Zuko has had so much growth throughout this entire series, but this isn't necessarily a negative or a criticism. I think I was just hoping at the end of the second season that given with how things transpired, because it's a pretty devastating moment when Zuko chooses Azula and the Fire Nation and the potential of restoring his honor over his uncle, the right thing, the avatar, you know, he has this decision in front of him and he reverts back and it's devastating. But there was a part of me that was thinking, okay, well, this will at least allow us to see Zuko back in the Fire Nation and more specifically, it'll allow us to see him interacting with his father. I was really looking forward to that. I've been really looking forward to seeing more Ozai and we still have gotten basically none and it is bumming me out a little bit. It's not just that we haven't really seen Zuko with Ozai, we've also not really seen Azula with Ozai basically at all. And now we only have five episodes left after, you know, this, not after this particular episode, but after the end of this batch that I'm going to be discussing. And I think that, again, it's not that it's a cri criticism. I'm not saying that the show is bad for not including more with Ozai. But for me, I was really looking forward to that with this third season. So on a personal note, I am a little disappointed. Because now at this point, Zuko, obviously, even though that speech was really exciting and it was such a great turning point for him, there's also the, okay, well, we're closing the door. And that really bummed me out a bit. However, it is still nice to see Zuko get to this point. I personally think that the second season is really where a lot of his growth took place. He just couldn't really make sense of how he felt about things. He hadn't yet had that path presented to him because he was only currently on the path of attempting to restore his honor. And then when he actually had the decision in front of him of you can keep choosing this path or you now have this other one that will allow you to explore if you can get that honor back and if that's going to remedy and be a balm to all of your anger and your frustration and your self-hatred. And he had that option in front of him, even though he was learning to come away from that, to believe in himself, to actually see beauty in life that was separate from the expectations placed on him. Even though he was seeing all that, there was still that question in the back of his mind. So while I liked that he had this path presented and he ended up choosing what we as the viewers, I think a lot of us would feel would be the wrong path. I think that at the end of the day, a lot of that heavy lifting and that work was done in the second season. And this season was just sort of looking at, oh wait, what have I done? This isn't making me happy. This didn't fix all of my problems. And as a result, it almost feels, I'm not literally saying that it is more shallow than the second season, but it almost comes across that way because there's less to do at this point. It was more of just vocalizing to himself, I don't feel better. And then once he's had that moment, it's kind of like, well, that clears it all up. Once he's recognized that, and he's kind of seen with a clearer set of eyes, the reality of what's in front of him, he's much more differentiated, he's less focused on himself and more seeing things as they are, then it, he didn't really need to have all that much more happen. So I understand why we haven't been spending a ton of time with Zuko throughout this season, watching him as we did in the second season. But I noted that we didn't, in last week's video, I should clarify, that we didn't get to see the war meeting. And I had wondered if it's because it was going to reveal that they actually knew what was going to happen with the invasion or something. But I just was thinking, it seems like it's a pivotal moment. I... And I just mean like moments like that, 
I would have liked to have seen so much more of them because most of what we've seen with Zuko for this season has just kind of been like, he's hanging out with Azula, he's yelling at Iroh, and it's super obvious that he's misplacing his anger onto his uncle rather than recognizing he's actually angry at himself. And he's with May being a moody prince. <laughs> and I, uh, I mean, I think it makes sense that he's kind of looking at like, I betrayed my uncle and what I was recognizing was actually honorable. I betrayed all of that for this. And I just kind of might have wanted to have a little bit more before having him decide he no longer was going to be basically a puppet to the destiny his father had laid out for him. So again, to reiterate, I really liked this moment. There's a part of me that's just sad that that door has closed to more of those enlightening scenes with him and his family. Anyway, I focused on that for a really long time. <laughs> so moving on, uh, I... I wrote his mom because the topic of his mom came up again in this moment. And that made me feel a little better because when you actually see the Zuko alone episode in that flashback with his mom, I was like, I feel like it's purposefully leaving something up in the air. And I think I even said at that point that I have a feeling the show is doing this intentionally so that you wonder, and it's this mystery and that you're going to get more information later because it does have a tendency to kind of drop hints and then show things later. So to have that presented again, I thought was definitely fantastic. And also what a desperate last attempt by his dad to try and manipulate Zuko once again. And it's good to see that Zuko is now in a place where he's strong enough that even that, which is devastating, even that's not enough to pull him back. So I did really appreciate the mention and that Zuko had the emotional fortitude to turn away even with that presented to him. Also, it was very cool when he redirected the lightning. A nice shout out to the previous season when Iroh was teaching him. And speaking of Iroh, <laughs> I was like, no, it's the anti-serendipity moment where you're so ready for them to reunite and then Iroh's not there, which I kind of figured was going to be the case, but still I was... We're, we're, we have so little Iroh this season, and it's sad. And I was really ready for Zuko and Iroh to see each other again and have Iroh be like, yay, you're changed. You've officially turned your back on your stupid dad. And we didn't get that, which made me sad, but also I'm excited to see what's in store with that. There is one thing that while I was watching, I did wonder because Zuko tells his father, hey, I'm not the one that took out the Avatar. It was actually Azula, but she lied. So there you go. Now you know the truth. I did wonder if his father believes Zuko, I would expect at some point to get a scene where his father really berates Azula for lying. Not just lying, but also just being so incredibly deceitful as to lead his father to trust Zuko, which obviously he's now probably thinking was a mistake, and that the threat of the Avatar is still present. I would think that he wouldn't let that go very easily. But I suppose he might just think Zuko's lying, so there's no need to reprimand Azula. I don't know. I'd be curious because as I was just going on and on about uh, with not getting a whole lot of Zuko and Ozai, I have been wanting more Azula and Ozai, and I would think that that would be a really significant thing because if he banished his son simply for speaking out of turn at a war meeting when he was a kid then I would think having your daughter who told you the avatar was taken care of and it was, oh yeah, it was my brother over here that did that. And then for that to not be true and she knew that the avatar, there was a chance it was actually it being Aang, that the avatar was still alive. I would think, I would think Ozai would have a huge issue with that. But I suppose, I guess there's a chance that he just thinks Zuko's lying. I don't know. As far as the fact that the invasion proved to essentially be a failure, I did, it sounds so morbid, but I did kind of like that it failed. Not in a, I'm not happy about it. I'm just saying that in previous episodes, mostly in previous seasons, I've noted that there are times that I think it would be good for storytelling reasons and for personal character growth to actually see failure occur because a lot of times the characters, for example, there's the Air Temple episode where the Fire Nation you discover has been given weapons by the inventor. 
and Aang and Katara and Sokka are saying, no, this is wrong, we need to stand up to them, and then everything goes really well. They do stand up to them, and there was a part of me even then that was thinking, I, I kind of think it would have been more impactful if they saw how difficult it is for the general population to resist the Fire Nation, because then that just goes to show the stakes, and it, it shows why so many people can't just fight back on a whim, because they were pretty harsh on the person for that. I understand it is not great for him to be selling his inventions and his weapons to the Fire Nation, but also he's trying to consider all of these individuals who have fled and are seeking refuge. So I did think, obviously, the end of the second season does show failure. I'm not saying they've never done that at any point, but to have the invasion, what you, what I kind of feel like they led us to believe was going to be the big heroic moment, to have that completely fail, to have Sokka and Katara have to leave their father again, and leave so many of the troops that we all got everybody together, and then now so many of them are going to be taken. I feel like that was a real blow, and I respect that the show did that this way, because I think it really hits home, as I was saying the cost of resistance. It did make me really sad though when Aang was crying because at the beginning of this season he has it in his mind, I can't fail, I can't fail, I can't fail, and then I can only imagine how much this weighs on him because he he takes everything so personally and it, it did make me sad when he was crying. Moving on to episode 12, the uh, Western Air Temple. So I do really like that Zuko's kind of back to what I feel we saw a little bit of before he returned to the Fire Nation. I'm like, oh, there's the Zuko that I feel like a lot of us love because I couldn't stand moody boy Zuko. Moody in a different way than he's been because he's always been moody. But moody boy Zuko, moody pampered Prince Zuko, I did not like. So I'm glad that he's kind of back to, okay, I have to try to take accountability. I shouldn't say he's back to that because I don't know if he was that before. But I do feel like he's maturing, which is fun. And him just talking to the animals and trying to figure out how he was going to present himself to Aang, I really enjoyed that. More specifically though, I really enjoyed getting to see him think back on the moment of time after he's been exiled, but before we see him where he was first introduced in episode one, that time in between exile and that moment and the way that he was so set immediately because he was pretty smart and sweet when he wanted to so badly be a good heir to the throne before he was exiled. And then pretty quickly after in this flashback we get here, you see how angry he has now become and we see Iroh trying to help him right from the start. And I, I think that that scene was really sad to watch, especially not knowing where Iroh is and we haven't seen him really, we haven't seen him and Zuko together in so long, but I really appreciated getting that in-between glimpse. And I really liked that after the memory occurs, when we see Zuko again, he's thinking back on that, there is the way in which the animators conveyed his regret and his embarrassment, I would say, the way he's kind of pinching the bridge of his nose, I thought was excellent, the disappointment, but also the willingness to accept that he was that way and move forward. I just think it's great, great. I'm loving this. Also, I really liked that Appa approved. I wrote in my note, Appa approves. <laughs> the When he was getting all cute with Zuko and the rest of them, I, I was like, you guys, I understand that he's been pursuing you and making your lives miserable, but also if Appa's cool with him, you know, Appa's judgment, probably just rely on that. <laughs> just kidding. I'm kidding, even though I love Appa and that was very sweet and cute, but I actually respect that there was resistance. It wasn't this immediate like, well, okay, I guess you can join because he has <laughs> made them miserable for so long and it would be hard to trust him after everything that happened. So I'm glad that the show didn't just have it be this easy after everything he's done, this easy change for the dynamic between them, and that Zuko's really gonna have to earn their trust. I am so glad that they went that route, even though as a viewer, I'm like, there's only so many episodes left and I want them to officially be a team. <laughs> I'm glad that they didn't rush it. As for goofy humor, because I do feel like the humor's not been quite as much to my liking this season as it has been in previous seasons, but I did really like when Sokka was talking about Combustion Man because 
uh, <laughs> Zuko accidentally reveals, like, oh, I'm, he's listing all the things he's really sorry for, and he's like, I'm sorry for saying that assassin after you, and then Sokka's like, you're the one who sent Combustion Man, and then Zuko's reply is, well, that's not his name. I also really enjoyed bringing back that quote from what is one of the best episodes of the entire series, when he tells Aang, you said at one time you thought we could be friends. And I'm really liking, this season is kind of bringing a lot of things back into the equation, a lot of characters, a lot of quotes, a lot of aspects of the characters. I complimented last week the fact that Toph looks back at her decision to leave her family, and I thought that was a really good thing to include. So I think that moment, a uh, kind of throwback to that episode, I thought was a good thing to include here. Episode 13, The Firebending Masters. This episode was really cool. I'm really glad that you got to see Aang and Zuko have a moment together, basically. And just in general, the the way in which this episode, it sounds stupid to say the way it was shot, because it's not obviously, they're not using a camera to capture real events, but the imagery and the way they would follow, there was one scene in particular when Aang and Zuko are doing that dance and the dragons are behind them, the way it sort of follows them. It looked really cool. It could have been really cheesy easily and it wasn't whatsoever. It was awesome. And I do want to compliment a lot of moments in this show that could have leaned into being cliche or not being as impactful they've actually really transformed them into some of the best scenes of the show and some action scenes that I feel like in theory, they feel like action scenes that shouldn't have much to them, shouldn't evoke that much emotion, really do. And even though I don't know if I'd quite categorize this as action, uh, although who cares, you can categorize it as action if you want, but the dance part with the dragons was just so breathtaking and it kind of got you really pumped, but also it just felt like a culmination of so many things all at once. And I really loved it. I loved the imagery. I loved the use of the colors. I loved the way that you have Zuko and Aang working together. It was just great. It was just great. I really liked this episode, but I really appreciate that Zuko is still such a grump all the time. I'm glad it's not like Zuko's nice now, so he's a completely different character. He's not. He's still the person that we've seen time and time again. It's just he's trying to be better, and that takes time, and that's something I think the show has done really well throughout the entire series, is that it shows the amount of time it takes, the amount of effort it takes for a person to actually change. On the flip side, though, people's personalities don't just go away. So even though he's making steps forward toward being a better person, he is still somebody who is inclined toward grumpiness. I also want to say, because I've been talking about Zuko a lot, but Aang had some really great moments. And once again, a moment of humor that I have liked in this batch of episodes is when Aang is talking to those people and he doesn't want them to get captured or harmed. And he's like, I don't usually use this card, but I'm the Avatar. <laughs> and I just really, I don't know, it was really cute. Aang, Aang might consistently throughout this series, Aang might be my favorite. I mean, Appa is top tier favorite. Obviously, I love Iroh, but he's not as prominent as some of our other characters. And even though I feel like Zuko is sort of that tortured character that is, it, it kind of naturally facilitates you being intrigued by them, I think it is harder to make people root for the lovable sunshine character, but Aang is really great. I think he's a really great character, and I think he's precious. And anyway, I just really liked that line. I thought it was cute. I also really liked that Iroh, you kind of get a little bit of history with him and the dragons that he knew and that he lied about hunting the last one. And I just wrote in my notes, oh, Iroh protected the dragons because Iroh couldn't get precious. He, he's not precious enough. <laughs> he also protects these uh, endangered animals that made me happy. And then last we have a two-parter that didn't have to get broken up, which would be the boiling rock. And a refresher, if you don't recall, this is when Zuko accompanies Sokka to try and find out if his father is at this prison that is in the middle of this really dangerous area. And this whole particular plot line did make me wonder, and I didn't touch on this before because I wanted to wait until I got here, that Obviously, the invasion plan, the Fire Nation ended up having information on it, hence why they were able to prepare for it. And if I were to guess, I would say that it was the end of season two when uh, the 
Kiyoshi warriors were taken out, and you see Azula and Mei and Tai Li took their place, and then whatever the dumb emperor's name guy was is just telling them everything, and you're like, buddy, come on. I know that, I want to be clear, I know that he thought he could trust them, and I know he doesn't have a history of actually leading, <laughs> so he's not got tons of experience, and it's not like you would instantly see him become a political mastermind and be very wary about who he tells what, but still, I was like, oh, come on, man. So I'm assuming it was either that or when Katara got captured. Because at the end of season two, she's imprisoned, and that's when her and Zuko are talking, and they both bring up their moms, and then Azula comes into the, the picture. But anyway, so it had to have been revealed at some point, either with both of those characters or one of those characters had to have accidentally given away the plan. I'm guessing the reason that they didn't think about it, uh, they being our party, Aang and Katara and Sokka, I have to imagine that they either just figured, okay, well, now that Azula took the Earth city of Ba Sing Se, that she'll probably assume that the plan's off and they won't now be expecting the invasion. I'm guessing they had to have either thought that or the horrors of Aang potentially dying and that traumatic experience made them kind of forget that there was probably a chance that Azula figured everything out. And then there's another part of me that's like, if there's a pretty big event that leads to the entire Fire Nation being weakened, even though they discovered this information in in the library, there's also another part of me that's like, well, they know people used to go to this library. So did they not think that there would ever be a chance that someone from the Fire Nation would know or chart the stars and know when eclipses were going to happen and things like that? Did they think that nobody would have ever thought okay, on this day that we're going to be weak, we need to make sure that we really up security, we'll say. I don't know. I just, the reason I'm bringing this up in reference to these last two episodes is because there was a part of me that thought it might be a good idea for our characters before the invasion day to try and sort of infiltrate the Fire Nation and gain more information that way they could report that information back when the invasion day was going to happen. They could let the soldiers know, or the various people who showed up, they could let them know where weak spots were, or they could let them know, oh, the Fire Nation, they're going to be here. The Ozai is going to be here. Azula is going to be here. Like they would try to gain insight into the Fire Nation's plans leading up to the invasion, and then they would be more prepared. And I was like, well, maybe the show just figures it would be too difficult. And then in this section, this whole two-parter is kind of like an infiltrating plot line. And so there's a part of me, I'm like, ah, I kind of wish we'd had infiltrating plot line earlier. You can still have the failure of the invasion where our characters, maybe there could be something where Azula realizes there's one of them in their ranks. And so she sort of purposefully feeds bad information to them. So then they get tricked. Something like that could have occurred. Although I recognize that that would be kind of similar to what happened in Bossing Say, because you do see her purposefully talking out loud, really obviously, to the other, her, to Ty Lee and May, and then other people pick up on that information and they pass it along. And so it would have been similar. I'm not saying that my, my laid out possibility here is better than what would have happened. I just think I, I had thought, I'm surprised they're not trying to infiltrate the Fire Nation and we did get some episodes that felt kind of similar to episodes we got in previous seasons. And maybe we could have had something a little different. Uh, but alas, that's not what happened, which is fine. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I did think it was not a plot hole by any means, but I did think it wasn't the biggest surprise that Ozai was ready. And I kind of feel like our characters, it was a bit of an oversight to think, hey, there might be a chance that they're prepared. Let's see if we can find out more information before the big invasion day. Anyway, getting to these episodes though, I do like the Sokka and Zuko dynamic <laughs> because they're, you would think that Aang and Zuko are polar opposites because it is sort of like the non-romantic version of Grump and Sunshine, but there's something about Sokka that feels more opposite to Zuko for me <laughs> for some reason. I don't know if it's because they're more along the same age group and, 
you just see that because you you have seen parallel paths with Suko and Aang, and even though outwardly they're very different, they still struggle. Uh, they take things very personally. Where Sokka feels very like carefree and like yeah, whatever. You kind of saw that at the very beginning of season two when that one Earth city is trying to manipulate Aang into accessing the Avatar state, and uh, <laughs> and Katara tells him like I can't follow you if you're gonna be doing this Aang and Aang's really sad and then Sokka's like whatever man I'm with you like he doesn't have to think too long on most things um I do like that we're seeing Sokka have guilt and feel like there was some responsibility on his shoulders for the fact that the invasion plan failed which of all characters I'm like definitely wasn't your fault <laughs> but anyway I just feel like Zuko and uh and and Sokka are kind of opposites in a lot of ways, but seeing them together is just a lot of fun. And I especially liked the line where they're talking about uh, their girlfriends. <laughs> and he says, my first girlfriend turned into the moon. And then, and then Zuko just rolls with it and says, that's rough, buddy. I really appreciated that moment. I, I kind of feel like, because I mentioned before that I thought that the UA thing was one of the weaker parts of the first season. And uh, I kind of feel like the show has made fun of itself in that way. So it almost makes it worth it. <laughs> really, I've really been enjoying the way in which our characters are each having moments with Zuko. And I'm glad for this, especially because we only have so much time left. So I'm glad we're really centering on how they're building this trust. And I, I think it's great that Zuko is so eager to do the right thing that he accompanies Sokka. And I was so excited when Suki was back. And Suki is awesome. I loved the moment when, uh, toward the end of this whole arc, when they're like, how are we going to get up there in this one area? And then she just scales the walls and gets the guy. And I really liked, I wrote in my notes, Suki and Azula round two. And then there's even a quote where um, it says, rematch I've been waiting for. And I was like, yeah. And I liked that Sokka got to be reunited with his father. I liked Sokka taking action. And, and you kind of see him grow into this role that he's been trying to put himself to from the beginning. And he kind of stumbled through what he thought being heroic or being a, sol a soldier or a warrior. You saw him have these ideals. He just didn't know how to reach them. And he actually is taking steps toward in a lot of ways. So I like the moments we've gotten with Sokka. But after the beach episode, I'm sure a lot of you knew this was coming, that I would probably, when I talked about my predictions for Azula, I'm sure for some of you, you were thinking, oh, I wonder what she's going to think when May ends up fighting Azula, and then Ty Lee ends up using her restricting your bending abilities uh, moves on her. So, thoughts here. Obviously, I laid out my predictions, but if you need a refresher or if you didn't see that, I talked about in the beach episode that given how Azula tried to very casually present the fact that it hurt when her mother viewed her as a monster, uh, but you can tell it actually did affect her. That to to kind of briefly sum up what I said, I was basically saying that I feel like Azula, deep, deep down, whether she realizes it or not, she needs people to choose her. And she never actually has people choose her. When people side with her, it's always through force. You even see that with how she recruits Ty Lee to help her. May was a little easier because May was bored in that one area and she was like, you want to accompany us? And she's like, oh yes, please, or whatever. But Ty Lee was happy at the circus and she pretty much threatened to kill her or harm her or at the very least put her in danger if she didn't obey, essentially. So I feel like there has sort of, I've been waiting for there to be a realization. I was kind of hoping you'd actually see that more in the beach scene where Ty Lee would recognize that Azula is kind of not a good friend whatsoever, but she's also maybe not the brightest bulb in the bunch. So I feel like she's not, and we don't see a lot of how Ty Lee feels and how she thinks. We've got not a lot of scenes with her, so it makes sense. But when she finally kind of almost instinctively, and she seems like she even surprised herself, goes after Azula when Azula was going after May. I am just, I wrote in my notes, uh, Ty Lee chose May, and I think that this is going to completely unravel Azula, because obviously Zuko turned his back on, on them already, which even though 
you see Azula in her typical way go after him and she doesn't seem that choked up about it. I still think that that probably bothers her, but to have this happen, I feel like that's it for her. <laughs> so here's a notable moment. And then I guess I'll see what happens in the last chunk of episodes. We don't have very many episodes left. So I guess we'll find out what happens there. Uh, that's it though. I don't think there's anything I forgot. I'm sure there's things I forgot. Um, but those were the things I most wanted to highlight about this batch of episodes. Anyway, I do think that this season, um, I, I will say in previous seasons, season one and season two, there were a couple episodes uh, in the beginning that I was thinking, okay, I don't love these episodes, but these other ones have been really good, and I think it's going to build from here. Like, the first season, a lot of you may recall, I didn't love the fifth episode, the one where you first are introduced to Boomy, but I also really liked the opening, so I thought, okay, I didn't love this episode, but moving forward, I have really high hopes, and those hopes and expectations were met. And then in season two, I really loved the first couple episodes, and there was a few that I was like, ah, I don't know, but I'm hoping these are just sort of the not as impactful episodes of the season. And, and then, oh my gosh, was season two just top tier, fantastic storytelling, character development, action. I was just talking about in this video that there are certain action scenes that they do a really great job with. The drill is a perfect example. That was, there's no reason it should have been so cool, and it was. So that season had it all, basically. This season has had me, it's been the most wobbly for me. I had a lot of things I was really looking forward to seeing, a lot of expectations, basically based off of how good the first two seasons were. And the first 10 episodes, while they certainly had some great moments, they also had a lot of moments that were not as consistent as I feel seasons one and two were. So I feel like this batch of episodes, it feels like we're finally locked back into the brilliance that we've seen before, which is not to say that I, I want to be really clear that I'm not saying my opinion is the correct one. I'm not saying the first 10 episodes are objectively bad or anything like that. It's just that I... I think where the other seasons I had maybe a tiny bit of, well, I didn't love that episode as much. I thought the rest from episode six on were so good. And this, I, I it could just be that I've been really nervous because I'm like, this is the final season. But I did get kind of nervous after uh, my, I, I wasn't immediately wowed by episodes six through 10. There was aspects of those episodes that still had me feeling hesitant but this batch of episodes I really, really enjoyed. So I'm really excited. We only have one section left and I'm, uh, it's, it's gonna be over soon, but it's been great. I'm really looking forward to that last batch. I do wanna say, if you didn't see my community tab posts, after watching through the rest of the season, I am going to, I, I'm planning on continuing to do some Avatar content. And some of it is going to be community-based. So I'll ask over on my community tab and then over on my Patreon as well uh, certain questions. And then I'll read off your thoughts on things, respond to your thoughts. I think it'll be a lot of fun. And just be on the lookout if you want to participate in those. Just be looking at the community tab post. If you don't know, uh, I'll when I ask those same questions, I'll always make sure that I read through the patron responses. So if you want to guarantee that your thoughts get read, then I'll have uh, my Patreon linked and you can you can uh, post your thoughts there. But I will try to get through as many of the community tab post things as possible. That's not happening just yet, but keep your eyes peeled because I'm really looking forward to having more discussions that are not just smaller chunks at a time, but speaking after having watched the entire show. I think that'll be a lot of fun. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts on this particular batch of episodes. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.